Good morning, and welcome to North Chapel's Sunday service. Today is March 14th, 2021, and we, I'm very glad that we don't have to worry about walking into church at the wrong hour, because today is the first day of daylight savings. But good news, tomorrow is napping day, so you can catch up and get your time clock reset. I'm so glad that before the week is out, we will arrive at the first day of spring, the vernal equinox. And I think our sugaring season's begun. My name is Jenny Gelfin, and I'm happy to be with you here today. It's International Ask a Question Day. That's a tradition in the Unitarian Universalist Church and also in my family. March is also Optimism Month something I go for, and Spiritual Wellness Month, something we can all strive for. Both those designations are a good match for the worship theme this month, Possibility. In describing possibility, the worship committee says, every moment has potential. Are we curious, opening our hearts and engaging our imaginations to look for the palette of colors besides the black and white of a thing? We can take a risk and explore multiple perspectives, including fresh new ones. How will we step through each threshold, finding the possibilities beyond? I remember my painting teacher, Rebecca Gottesman, telling us that black is really a mixture of hues, and that if you look closely at whites, they're rarely just white, as the contours of a snowfield might be, say, hinting amber, soft rose, faint steely blue. The last time I said welcoming words, I stood outdoors. It was late fall. I planned to speak to you from there. I stood beside one big pine, or was it many? Trunks were like dancers lifting skyward. I'm fascinated by how trees seem to merge and diverge above ground and apparently also below. I wish humans could be more like that. On that border between woods and field, I could turn around and look out over the broad heave of dying late autumn grasses, past the naked birch, beyond receding tiers of lavender hills, towards distant undulant peaks under a gray, gray sky. I was standing in one beautiful spot in the vastness of our world. But the wind spoke louder than me, <laughs> so I had to retreat inside so that you could hear me. That hill today is bright in snow cover, with branch tips just beginning to blush, their spring hues. Today, again, I choose to stand in warm quiet beyond the voices of birds and cars rumbling and trees talking with the breeze. I wonder, are we really listening to each other? respecting each other, including our differences and distinctions. Perhaps disagreeing without being disagreeable, seeking paths into a future that we can all accept. March is International Ideas Month, also International Mirth Month. <laughs> I don't know which appeals to me more of those two ways to move forward in this moment. Maybe lots of ideas, with a little bit of mirth. Our minister, Reverend Dr. Leon Dunkley, will give today's reflection. After this service, you can join a coffee hour Zoom meeting at 11. Separately, the Amazing Grace will have a Zoom meeting at 11.30. So at the end of the service, if you get out of the full screen mode, you should be able to see below the video links to those meetings plus to our church website, where you'll find a lot of information, including a really great auction that's going on, and a chance to donate. Please join me in singing our opening hymn, The Wordless Mountains Bravely Still.
My name is Laura Foley, and I'm speaking to you from a hilltop in South Pomfret, Vermont. Many of us are feeling very sad today, members of the UU community and of the poetry group that I'm in, the Wednesday Poets, because we have lost a beloved member, Wendy Smith. I wanted to read a couple of poems that she wrote and for all of us to celebrate that we are here. She would have so loved entering into spring. She loved springtime, flowers, birds. She loved her dog. She loved traveling. So I think all of those come through, all of those loves come through in her poetry. This one is called Eiders. Oh, I so love common eiders. Meditating this morning, what I espy are memories from last week's trip. I see the sand bask under the sunlight at Pebble Beach, while beyond drakes bob about in Sandy Bay. They sport a black skull cap with mask. The rest is an oreo of black belly and wings with white back and face. The fashionably plumage mingle with reddish-brown hen friends in an assembled group called a raft. Their eider feathers are a fine soft down gathered for quilts from their nest linings. The sparkling serene ocean is their stage as they dive for mollusks in harmony. This silent symphony blossoms as my meditation metaphor a vision that flowers into my beloved mom's song. And this poem, she wrote a whole series of poems in the, in the voice of her dog, Ori, her beloved dog, Ori. Dog Park Postcard. A thousand acre dog park gem with no fence and no leash, if you obey voice commands. Yes, I have been there, speaks Ori Pup. Oh, it's fields, woods, rocks, shoreline, walkways, all our favorites. We drive over after breakfast. Today we snag the last parking spot. I enjoy my idyllic combo freedom, run, play, hike, and swim here. Once my foregoer even found a turtle laying eggs in the forest. It's up in a pine tree state, right across the street from the ocean. It includes a little long pond and a boathouse. Way fun. Late morning, the stallions and their riders head out for the trail. I am careful not to chase after them. Paths? Yes, a long loop one around the pond. Lots to do. All this makes me feel happy and free.
Good morning and good Sunday. I hope that this new day finds you well. My name is Leon Dunkley, and I'm honored to serve as minister here at North Universalist Chapel Society, or North Chapel, in Woodstock, Vermont. Today is Sunday, March the 14th, and I am so very glad to see you this morning. It is good to be together. The title of this morning's reflection is Kindness is Also Possible. On the far side of all of the stories that we tell, kindness is always possible, always promising. But many times we do not choose to tell the stories of kindness. We don't always take the time to sing its praises. We tell stories of rage and we tell stories of war and we tell these stories in the tongues of men and angels. The drama, the action, the excitement, we are drawn by these. They are fascinating. How did Shakespeare put it? Let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. And we've done that and I think we've done that well. And we've done that enough perhaps because the story of kindness is always possible. Maybe it's time, finally, to sit upon the ground and tell stories about kindness. Maybe it's time to sing its praises. Now, I'm thinking about kindness because I've been touched by the loving gesture of our beloved Wendy Ann Smith. Monthly, she would step into the pulpit and gently drive home the point that there are people in our community who are suffering, who are hurting, who are hungry, monthly. She would encourage us to bring donations for the food shelf. She would remind us of the spirit of joyful possibility by living joyfully herself. <laughs> Just to see what happens, despite the seemingly insurmountable challenges of life. So, in her honor, I offer these words by David Wilcox. He sings a song called Kindness, and this time for Wendy. I love your sense of humor. I love to see you smile, and I love your sense of balance, and I love your sense of time. I love your music in the morning that sounds all through the night, but it's your kindness that shines so bright. I love your beauty, and I love your gentle moves, but more, I love your honesty. You always tell the truth. I love your vision of, your, of the future, and your hope that never dies, but it's your kindness that clears my skies. And I love your wisdom and your knowledge of the past, your willingness to listen, your taste for what will last. I love your compassion for the suffering and your solid happiness, but it's your kindness that I love best. I went outside the other day <clears throat> because I had not done so in too long a while. I'd grown comfortable with taking life in voyeuristically from Zoom screens, from cell phones and computers, from that station apart and like a spectator <laughs> tuning into the story of my own life. Tuning into this story and not writing it. I needed to get back into the saddle and live life more directly. I realized that I became aware it is a strange thing, slowly or suddenly, to come into an awareness of one's own life, to corner the market on self-conscious awareness and to step truly into oneself. These things are rather strange, aren't they? They are normal too, strange, normal, and miraculous. I went outside because I had not done so in a long while and I climbed a slow mountain because it was there. I stepped inside the poetry of life for just a while, just because I could, and I climbed a slow mountain, but it toppled me. It toppled me and I fell down. I started up the mountain and I went as far as I could, but then I rested, panting, breathing heavy, surprised by how tired I was. And so very quickly, uh, I'm not in shape. I'm not as strong as I used to be. So I fell, or rather, part of me did. Part of me fell down. My ego fell down, <laughs> and I let it. My body needed me more than my boyish pride. So 
I had to streamline. I was climbing up the side of a good slow mountain, but it was fighting me, pushing me back down to earth. It was fighting back. <laughs> I was fighting back, but I was losing. And the mountain had the, it, it had the advantage. The fix was in. <laughs> the deck was stacked. Gravity was not on my side, and that made me mad. Uselessly mad, but mad nonetheless. <clears throat> all, <clears throat> all I had on my side was my attitude and my pretenses. And neither of these things will help you climb a mountain. I needed energy and I needed strength and I didn't have it. All I had were stories about how strong I used to be. The mountain didn't care about my stories. It just pushed me back down playfully <laughs> without even, expend without even ex expending any effort. That's what toppled me. That's what broke me. <laughs> my ego, my pride, my attitude and all. Once they had fallen away, the mountain asked me to be honest with myself. I was at the limit of my strength. I was tired. I didn't want to be honest with myself. I wanted comfort. I wanted to listen to my own thoughts, and I didn't want to pay attention to what the mountain was telling me. I didn't want to be honest with myself. I thought maybe I could lie to myself just a little, convincingly, of course, I could persuade myself that I haven't gotten weaker over time, that I am stronger, more physically fit, and more in shape than I actually am. I wanted to please my ego and its attitude and its pretense. I didn't want to admit the truth and let my tender ego fall away, but that's what I did. I just conceded. I told the truth and then things changed. I took off my hat and I laid it on a frozen ridge pile by the roadside, the ridge pile left there by the plow the last time that it snowed. And I took off my North Face jacket, my technical jacket, as they say, and they call it that because of all these zippers and vents and pockets, the bells and whistles that come in handy when you're on an excursion in the Himalayas. I wasn't on an excursion in the, in the Himalayas. I didn't need all of its technicality. Besides, I was hot, I was burning off, so off it came, zip, zip, zip. <laughs> and I hung the jacket on a branch of a nearby tree, and I felt lighter. Then came the difficult work. I had to find a way to shed my ego. It wasn't as simple as shedding my hat and my jacket, but I found a way. It was something that I really needed to do. They say that need is the mother of invention, and I needed to shed my ego. I was panting. I was breathing heavy. I was surprised by how tired I was, and I was hot. <laughs> I was burning up on that warm late winter day. I needed to let go of what I was carrying, and so I did. I found a way to do it. I invented that possibility for myself. I left it all by the roadside, my hat, my, te my technical jacket, and my ego. I went on without them, catching my breath and accepting myself. I wasn't pushing myself to achieve, some, to achieve something external anymore. I was being newly kind to myself. I'm not always kind to myself. I'm outwardly kind, but, but not inwardly. I can be brutal on myself. <laughs> Do you make this mistake? Inwardly, I rage, I war. I fight within myself, so consumed sometimes with my shortcomings. I make great big trouble out of such small things sometimes when I forget that kindness is also possible. I went outside because I had not done so in a long while and I climbed a slow mountain up into the air just because I could and because it was there. I didn't see the world around me I didn't appreciate it. All I saw was my own rage, my own war, and the fight within myself. I didn't even see the road right beneath my feet with its melting snows and its mudslide textures squishing step by step. I didn't notice the stream flow trickle of the gullies on either side of me, the running water. There was a little beauty inside of me at the time, 
fighting with myself as I was. I was all caught up in that fight. I didn't see the beauty that was around me. Some people believe that God resides in little beautiful things. <laughs> in a bowl of soup, in a piece of bread, in a smile. And maybe we miss out a bit when we are unaware. Alice Walker wrote, more than anything, God love admiration. God's not being vain, just wanting to share a good thing. I think it angers God if you walk by the color purple in a field and you don't notice it. So I didn't notice the running water. I was tied up in myself. But when my ego fell away, when I finally shed its skin, I was newly aware of life. I wasn't just, it wasn't just the snow <laughs> around me that was melting away. I'm not always kind to myself, but I'm beginning to wonder why this is. I'm hard on myself and unforgiving, but kindness is also possible. But will I choose it? Will I choose kindness? And by kindness, I don't mean niceness, by the way. Uh, there is a distinction. Uh, as a meditation teacher named Kevin Ellerton points out, people often use words nice and kind interchangeably, assuming that they are basically the same thing. The truth is, the difference between nice versus kind is night and day. <laughs> nice is a self-centered behavior pattern where you are acting in a pleasing manner to be a nice person to get people to like you. Kind is an other-centered behavior where you are acting in the best interest of others and out of a sense of love, empathy, and compassion, end quote. Now, I get what he's saying here, but I don't know. Um, I sense a bit of tension when I read these words. I mean, I think it's a good thing to clarify these things. I think that it's useful to think about the differences between niceness and kindness, but I think Ellerton goes a little too far. There are nice folks all around whose behavior can't be described as self-centered. There are kind folks who are not exclusively focused on the needs of others. I also struggle with the polarity that he implies with his words, with the extremity of the opposites, you know? And that might sound funny, but it's true. There are degrees of opposition. I mean, if there weren't degrees of opposition, why would we call some things polar opposites and not others? Our language obscures complex and beautiful truths sometimes. Few of us, if any, would disagree that the North and the South Pole are on polar opposite sides of our planet. One is on one side of the world and the other is on the opposite side. They could not be more different in this respect, but they're both pretty cold. <laughs> uh, uh, my mother wouldn't rather live in one than the other <laughs> warm-blooded woman that she is. Opposites are not always completely opposite. Life is weird that way. Nice behaviors and kind behaviors are not diametrically opposed. Sometimes they overlap like shingles. Sometimes they coexist. Most often they are necessary to each other. They are different, of course, opposites in a sense, but maybe they are different more like dusk and dawn than like night and day. Dusk and dawn can look very similar. Maybe they're just similar things, but facing in different directions. Maybe niceness and kindness are similar things because they need each other. Day needs night, and dusk needs dawn. And more immediately, more immediately, it's even more complex. It's obvious when one looks closely at the nature of the world, day needs night, but not quite right away. Day needs dusk, and dusk needs night, and night needs dawn, and dawn needs day. They are born of one another, they are dependent on one another, and they really need each other, and so do we. It's messy. 
maybe niceness and kindness are more like different snow melt mudslide roads that lead up and down the sides of the same slow mountain. Maybe they intersect sometimes and maybe they combine. Other times maybe they don't. I don't know. I'll have to sit with that a while. I'll have to reflect on this. Maybe all of these ideas will balance out. Maybe that's what wisdom is, compassionate wisdom. Maybe this is what we mean by loving kindness, by mindfulness. I've always wanted to know what mindfulness means. How do you define such a beautiful, huge thing as this? A man named John Kabat-Zinn remarks, what mindfulness is, has been in dispute for thousands of years. I'm quoting him now. Different traditions speak in slightly different ways about it. I came a long time to formulate a common sense, a common sense definition, but one that was also mysterious. Something where you couldn't just get it by thinking. A definition that is designed to point to something that is beyond mere cognition. He says mindfulness is the awareness that rises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. Now this may sound simple enough, but it's hard to live this out. It can be actually quite difficult to live this out. I used to think sometimes that I didn't have time or space in my life to meditate. <laughs> I wonder what would have happened if I had shared this, this thought with John Kabat-Zinn. I imagine that it would have made him laugh. I imagine that he would have laughed at me and quoted himself saying, Leon, you've got nothing but time. The question is, how are, gonna, how are you going to use the time that you have? Because the stakes are actually extremely high. They are so high that it's important not to take this whole thing too seriously. We have to approach it with a sense of humor. It's too serious to take seriously. And I'm quite serious about that. And then I hope that he would smile again, his great big knowing smile, his big, great big embracing smile, a smile that's large enough to hold paradox and confusion, that's big enough to hold the fullness of the truth. It's so easy to tell stories about the drama, about the hardship, about the rage, about the wars within ourselves. It's much harder sometimes to tell stories of simple courage, to tell stories of simple kindness. Our own hymnal reads, seek not afar for beauty. Lo, it glows in dew-wet grasses all beneath our feet. Beauty, wisdom, glow in dew-wet grasses beneath our feet in snowmelt running waters along the roadside, and in the view from the top of a seemingly insurmountable challenge in life. Kindness can help us see the truth of this, the depth of it. Kindness can help us to share our hearts with each other uh, with abandon. There are plenty of artful wisdom teachers all, about, all around us in our time. Hurston and Hemingway, Cather and Collins, Baldwin and Banks, Frost and Laura Foley, Alice Walker and David Wilcox, who gently sings, I love your wisdom and your knowledge of the past, your willingness to listen and your taste for what will last. I love your compassion for the suffering and your solid happiness, but it's your kindness that I love best. Kindness is also possible. No matter how steep, no matter the size of the mountains we choose to climb, even if they seem insurmountable, no matter the challenge and no matter the cost, may we choose to be beautifully wise. May we recognize and cast off what does not serve us on life's journey. Ego, pride, privilege pretense, impossibility. May we lay down what no longer serves us by the roadside where it can melt away in the strengthening sun, in the strengthening sun and be transformed by its light into kindness, into possibility, 
into that which blesses the world. May it be so. Blessed be and amen. Branch.